Sounded like a little falter right there. Uh, not. Just giving a break for your little twitching going on, your little rubbing your feet. Making that sound. I don't know why. This last week somehow impressed me deeply about how dysfunctional we are as a people. And looking about, I'm not really too happy for us. And I'm not quite sure what I want to do. What to, how to approach all that. What we've seen in the last year was an, in, an interesting story about people, and in globally. Just as I was suggesting would be, be to, we'd be shown. And I asked, would we rise up with the hindsight of how it's done to us? Or not? And thus far, we have not. And so, we're agreeing to the the abuse and it's not going to get better and i it just i don't know what it's not said that because it's doom it's planned not to get better i said planned not to get better are you listening planned someone has a plan your silence against it allows them to execute that plan we now see how pervasive the agents of that plan are the agents of change we were told about agents of hope and change are. And my view of all these things that I was watching this last week, oh, did have they selected the captor-in-chief yet, folks? You know, nobody has selected anybody yet because the electors have not spoken, and that happens here in another about a month. For those of you in states that can persuade or potentially so, without getting yourself in any trouble, the elector in your state that isn't pledged, or even so there, can move in their conscience to change the what they thought they their vote. And that's the tale of the tape for all that. And we heard about this, like, last four years. It seems to be coming up over and over again. I don't know what more to point out to people about that. What is coming and what is rolling out, I told you it was a respite. It's coming on us again. It's all in the game. It's what's going on, the game against us, the game plan. We see the documents are even talking that way. The exercise is ongoing. And none of us really are stopping it. And I say none of us in the general. There are some particularly that are doing some. And those that are really at the point of the spear finding out it's not so easy that you put forward your what do you say you put forward the effort you put forward the proper statement you put forward all these things and yet you walk into this system that doesn't want doesn't want to uh, respond or it's complicit and this is an interesting thing I'll just quickly state We'll, we'll talk a little bit. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to reference it. Uh, the Tulis report and the petition in Tennessee exposes all of this stuff. And anybody looking in, I think Ranchero 42 is noticing that the judge is reluctant. And, and that's right. The, the, the judiciary, the executive and the judiciary and the legislature are complicit against the people. And so there's a, it's going to be a different thought that comes to brain, uh, your brain about this. A lot of people don't want to even discuss it. A lot of people think that there's nothing they can do. In fact, as I move in, and before I go too much farther, forget interrupting this current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is Cricketude Busting Episode BTWRLM395. Thank you very much for those who've listened all these years. You know, we're way past 395. This is just for this network. And hoping, beyond hope, that people would step up for themselves. I may have, part of the thought I had this week was maybe I've uh, overestimated what, what people would be interested in. As I thought, maybe we just need a direction on how to better do things. And then I'm finding out maybe people aren't so interested. And that's, that's really on us. Again, it's not resisting just to say resist and all this other stuff we saw. Or what? Uh, trust the plan, right, folks? I mean, this is just, you better have a plan, and you better move it on, 
because they have a plan and it's not has nothing to do with you in any good way. In fact, you become the fuel for the fodder that you are. You become fertilizer to grow their flowers. And before I move even farther than that, back in normalization of ignorance YouTube, thank you for the comment over there. Uh, Troll Heaven Don't Do It, I suppose the name is, Troll Heaven Don't Do It, uh, asked the questions and was responding to me saying that I involve myself, I have, I guess, the audacity to involve myself with this, the corrupt system. And uh, that's an interesting view that people take. I always find interest in that. And I've also, if you've listened to me, I don't know how long Troll Heaven has ever listened. But if you li most of you listen, you know there's a reason for why I've decided to do that too, on top of everything else. But let me, here's the question, here's the comment. Help in making legislation? Wait! Why would you be participating in a system that's, to its core, corrupt? How would you expect system changing affecting legislation would pass in such an environment? Doesn't even make sense. And again, these are the comments. It's fine to see that, and that's great. It's a pretty clear observation, but it's one of someone, you know, most people that haven't engaged all that and really don't have, certainly don't come from my view that this system is going off the rails. And if you want any protection, you're going to have to jump in and you're going to have to figure out how to make protections as you go. It, it's, it's on the go that it's happening. And we found out through Jefferson Mining District, and I looked at this before we even got the district started, part of the impetus, is, impetus to start that district was because that district underneath the mining law is a, is a separate government. Government separate in its institution from governments. It, it, in fact, is a foreign state to all either federal and state governments. It's afforded certain things underneath laws. And those were chosen because there isn't, it is a corrupt system. It's not because we're participating with it. In fact, the Jefferson Monday stands as being something separate and, in a way, not to attack, but needs to attack the lawlessness that's in that system. Yes, it is corrupt. On the other hand, we also found out that we can influence, and this is part of the game, in this democracy they want to purport, that those legislations are going through whether or not you participate. And they're not, again, the future we want was not including you. In our 2013 lawsuit, where we sued the government for what it had done, in, in part utilizing certain techniques of leverage funding, which is a plunder on property owners, to advance sustainable development and international imposition, was being done by the government in pieces and parts. The pieces and parts of which that got passed didn't look like anything, but they got assembled later in the legislature. The thing with COVID is you have a legislature who's actually put down a due process, but now the executive has violated, and the judiciary is going with it. That's another separation of, breach of uh, separation of powers problem. So the judiciary is complicit. So yes, it's corrupt. But wait, 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 legislation, I was telling you last week, I was helping to, write, as it's going in, write savings provisions to, to for remedies in laws that otherwise wouldn't have them. And so we're dealing with a corrupt system, yes. The whole thing's corrupt. But we also have the opportunity to throw in savings provisions to help remedies, or like I've told you before, Go to the police, find out what they're about, write their policies, help write their policies for them. Don't let them make the policies on their own. Because if you don't, they're going to come on and those policies are going to kill you. You won't even be able to do your own life. So not answering this in some way, finding some place you can jump in is very important, it seems, at this point. It may be our last gasp in a way. And it, sometimes it feels like that. But here's the thing that I talked about the legislation. I, I don't hope to be sound so critical, but I thought I explained that the reason why we were doing that was to bring in a provision so that because the legislation that was going to go in to be uh, uh, looked at to be passed had no protection. They, all they were do for this things like these health crises, crises, they were going to bring no protection. But what only wanted to reduce the uh, agreed-to tyranny by the governor. 
And we have an opportunity to influence a representative in a place where one of our, our my colleagues lives. We got the ear of the representative, and he allowed my colleague, and I'm back in the background helping him, to make subtle changes in the law, hopefully to be passed, which will give people in the future a place to protect themselves, notwithstanding the corruption, notwithstanding that the, everybody believes they can want to give this new legislation wants to give the wants to reduce the amount of don't make the crises indefinite that the governors declare we'll we'll confine them to some time. In other words, they agree to tyranny for that time and then one up they can re re up it is not something that while I'm watching. I want to be be silent on where we can bring in a savings provision to allow people to stop it, even the shortened time. Same thing if I go on now to why would you want to deal with a corrupt system? Well, the system's corrupt, and it uses that corruption to harm you even more and abuse you all the time. Let me remind you, if you haven't heard before, it's not reminding you. You're hearing it for the first time. Not just legislation, but another way to get at it was and it came to my attention, another colleague developed, produced a national fire policy in western states are on fire. And we've been looking at that problem for five years through the Jefferson Mining District on other matters for public land management. Comes to me the policy, even the policy. And this is where I've told you, this is a war. I don't care where I get an, a lingo, I've even a finger, a, a, a nail hold into something. I'm going to use it to jump in there. And I'm going to try and adjust something the best I can, and we'll try to set up a people we can work with in a corrupt system. And in the fire, federal fire policy, I read the fire policy. I did a so-called white paper between myself and the people we work with. And I said, here's the policy. This is the Achilles heels. This is where the power actually is. This is the fraud by the federal government not telling people where the power was, which is local, happens to be. And a commissioner or two has the power. They don't know that. We were working with these, at least well, we're funneled down to one eventually, able to not pass legislation, but to pass a public lands management policy change. So that the power got shifted by the po federal policy itself, by the terms of the federal policy, back to where the power was, so that the local commissioners could take control. And since then, we haven't had smoke in the air for months on end, except for this last year when there was the policy, the, uh, the arsonist hit the West. Those weren't planned subscribed burns. Those were actually arson. And yet, we'd also been jumped in just in time to allow people but to get the idea again, you can go fight a fire and don't have to wait on the government to twiddle its thumbs and, and manage fire. The idea that we were able to pre pass into the people again a year before by working with this corrupt system. And don't, and don't, don't under, misunderstand me. It is corrupt. It was a lot, five years of work to get these things through. But now we have policies and mentality in place to now go back again and suppress fire instead of manage fire. It changed the whole policy of the public land management for that purpose. It changed everybody's ideas. The system isn't any better, but now we have a check and a balance that was supposed to be there that everybody either didn't know or overlooked in our ignorance. If I'm being generous, in our ignorance, we didn't know. It took someone like myself settling down and saying, I don't want to read this stuff. I really hate reading this stuff. But if I don't, people are going to die. Peep, smoke. I'll be I'll be breathing smoke for months on end in summertime. It took myself to sit down and say, okay, here's the, here's what they have. Here's what they're doing to us, and handing what I found to someone who could then go work with somebody in that corrupt system, who the one in the in the system wasn't corrupt, but was up against the corrupt system, who just happens later to be recognized in Washington D.C. for how to properly do this stuff by Trump. And so, I went way off here on this. I didn't mean to spend so much time, but helping make legislation. Yes, because if you don't jump in where you can, you don't get it. They're going to make legislation that's going to hurt you. That's not. That's what I found. That's what we've found. That's what's consistent. You don't walk in and set a policy for you. You don't put your 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 study without making errors. Absolutely black and white. 
policy in that's right to show and expose the problem, they will use that to kill you. And they are. In fact, getting over to the David Tullis petition in Tennessee, if we look, looking in the rules, you find there's been some adjustments in the rules that allow an external control. Just like the Wildfire Policy Act was being used to offer external controls that actually are not there to not to be there. The method of the destruction is the same. It's going to take people to go into this corrupt system and understand where the corrupt, where the problem is and take it out, fix it. It makes, makes some adjustments. I don't care what they call it. I don't care if they call it an ordinance or a, a resolution or a plan, a policy, a code, a law. I don't care. It's there to harm you when you let the rats play. And they've been playing for a long time. Is this an ultimate answer? No, it's just what we're doing. It's what we can do. So, yes, there's a corrupt system, and that's why we're hurting. That's why we're suffering. That's why we're abused. And the society, apparently, is okay with that, because they'd rather fight amongst themselves. They'd rather not focus even on the thing that has them locked down, the thing that has them locked in their house and don't think that's a prison by an, a, on a force and effect that has no authority whatsoever. And everybody's cool with it. And I don't get that. I really don't get that. You think I, I thought I would have even heard squawking. I don't even hear the squawking. How would you expect a system change affecting legislation would pass? Well, we've gotten it happen a couple times. It's not all the legislation. It's parts of it. You'd be surprised at what happens and who steps up to, to, uh, to ob try to obstruct simple word additions. And I'm learning, you, I really have to, when I look at this, I have to look at finding literally four to five words that change the, the construction of something so that it isn't really noticed and it passes most people's perception. Because if you put more, the lawyers in the system will object to every bit of it. In fact, that's what they're doing to this new legislation we're trying to help write to put a savings clause and remedy in for people where a governor is still going to be abusive for 15, 20, 30 days to be re-upped again. They don't want the control. They don't want you to have any remedy. And this is also found in the petition in Tennessee. It's named inside the petition that the Bar Association is there to foist upon the United States of America and anywhere the rule of law democracy is, they're planning to foist upon you a foreign control. Well, if you go back and look at the fire policy, risk management is sustainable development, if you understand this. Risk management is the shift that the federal government went to that we circumvented at the local level to give the county the power back to the county, which is representative to the people, under law. Because we got involved because the system is corrupt. And then we made the correct, the proper changes. And so, you know, again, I didn't mean to go so far. This is such an important problem. It is how we've gotten where we are that today we look at a week. It's really an ongoing you know, clowns and circuses, not breads and circuses. It's clowns and circuses. And we keep embracing that. We've been embracing it for the lead up of the year to something that everyone understood the outcome would be. It's not going to really mean anything different, but we still have to focus on the things that have us locked down. And what happened to that? What were you doing to protect yourself? Likely not a whole lot. Likely nothing. And so not engaging with that system, you're seeing directly what COVID-19 has done when you don't engage the system to maintain even, well, see, the the system, it's the not the law necessarily that's corrupt. It's those that are wielding, not wielding the law, and you're allowing that. That is corrupt. In, in the last two decades, I've seen legislation shift to where they kind of ignore, they throw in a five-word savings provision that if you know the law, you can stop them, but then that covers over what, that allows other people to, to just miss the point. No different than when we look, I looked at the wild, national wildfire policy, I get down to some somewhere in the middle of it, and I says right in the passage that the county has the power, and I'm looking, well, what's the problem? What's the question? The law, the policy was respective of the Constitution, respective of the Tenth Amendment, respective of the actual power, but the implementation was com completely criminal. 
So I also, I guess, would say be careful on when we look at the system, the system to the core. Which it's the operators of the levers that are corrupt, and that was to be checked by the vigilant mass. And so, without selling, I don't want to sell. Sound like I'm selling that. I'm saying that this is what I've found. That's my experience. Until we engaged it, we had no control. It was going off the rails. When we engaged the corruption, not the system, we actually acknowledged that the law might be right. Go look at the Tulis Report uh, petition in Chancery there in Tennessee for the COVID. It says the law that required the local administrator, a health administrator, to identify the infectious agent was violated. So it wasn't the law that was wrong. That provided the protection. It was the maladministration that is the problem, that in your silence doesn't get checked. And so there's a, a fine line between calling the whole system of corrupt and not looking at really what's going on that kind of blows by everybody. And I really appreciate the question because I get this a lot. Why, why engage the system because it's corrupt? No, it's the people in it that are corrupt. Actually, when you start looking very carefully, the guidelines are pretty clear. They, they aren't that bad. Yeah, there's some places we could find. There's some things. But generally, no. For as corrupt as the Bar Association is, it's worked hard to try and make, keep up the pretense of a due process. That's all still there, too. So the very idea of thinking that the system is corrupt, in other words, the government establishment is corrupt for precluding you from act engaging where it is corrupt in other words where those that are wield miswielding the the levers that actually don't exist that is what's causing our trouble one of the things and there's a, quite a few ways to get at that i don't necessarily even uh, advocate one i tend to speak in this case with covid like through habeas no one's really Moving that along, but that's that's what I think that's the easiest at this point. Even looking at the what the what the uh, Tulis uh, petition is doing, what that court's doing, reminds me to tell you, folks, look down the road. You really have to know what you're doing. The bigger the bigger chunk you try to bite into, the bigger responsibility you have to manage that. And habeas seemed to be the more more manageable one for most people, as I see. And even that's been almost impossible for people to understand even though I've explained how to get it done and where to go. The point is that just, I kept tell, I keep telling you, that is what you, the exploit, your ignorance of that is what is being exploited. Your failure to engage where the checks and balances was, is, and point it out, who's actually doing stuff, is the problem. Now, one or two of us, we can do some things, but we, we can't, again, stop the whole machine. So I said it takes the masses of people now. These people that are wielding the, the, the seats of decision have understood how to exploit you in your laziness, in your excuses. The one excuse that says, oh, the system's corrupt, so why do you think you can cause it to change? Well, I can't cause that much, cause that much change. What I can do is when the eight ball comes rolling down, down the, 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 the table, I can run up alongside it and I can start tapping it a little bit and make it miss its mark. Make it go in the hole. I can do, maybe take the cue ball and tap it just a little bit. I can't stop that cue ball. But I can cause it to be deflected just enough. Well, I hope, and maybe this was a, another thing that's going through my mind and just, just the dismay and disappointment, that more people would come to start tapping on the side of the cue ball heading for its target or the eight ball to make it go in the pocket at the wrong time or something like that, whatever analogy you want to do. And I'm finding out not many people really want to step up and do that. And so that was another part of the developing, I don't even know what the, I don't even know the adjective I, have, I feel. It's, I don't even know if it, it's getting beyond emotion. It's a reality that I'm watching unfold for people, and I'm not feeling very good for you all around that. And so way off the point here, but I think it's important, I suppose, I guess, to keep talking, I have to keep talking. Yeah, you can just pass, pass the buck. You cannot do anything. You can say the system's so corrupt that not to deal with it. But no, this is why it's corrupt. We really weren't vigilant to do things. Is there every place I can go in order to impose an influence? No, there's lots of places I can't go. In fact, I have to use colleagues. In fact, I have to, my position was to analyze the white, 
as make a white paper from the fire policy of the national fire policy and hand it to someone who could have an influence with somebody. And so we all learn where we can, we all learn our limitations and we, those that I work with have learned how we, what we have to use in those limitations and how we proceed despite those limitations to engage where we can for how we perceive things are going on. To, at any time, just to say or capitulate to any demand that's not correct is to give in to it and the consequence down the future, down the, down the road against you. As I can tell you, this builds and builds and builds in authority against you to the point where I've been telling you and people are just starting now to argue, uh, recognize you're not, you don't have a property in you despite the government having no, no title to you, you don't have a right, you don't have a property, you don't have property, at least you're told that and you agree with it because you don't challenge the, the, fr the felonies against it. And so I, I've suggested to, you to really look carefully that the su sustainable development condition is one of no government, of governance, is of rule, not law, and you're going to be put into a place where rule rules instead of law ruling, and law, it, it, rule doesn't look at property, not even you or the stuff you own, and then that takes out your ability and your right to acquire. And there, and there are more, more and more and more. And then to get it to and from that property and all this other stuff falls when you lose property. I said, I've told you, I haven't said this for a long time. If you don't know about property, you probably are property. You're owned by someone else. And if the minimum, if you have no property, they don't have to give you due process. And so those of you that have just agreed to the COVID orders without actually stamping up for yourself and protecting yourself and challenging that they didn't find the, determine the infectious agent objectively, you, you've allowed this to move on and you re surrendered uh, your uh, captive to that condition that can only get out, get worse against you because it has no check. So I, I don't know what really more, in a way, more to say. I really had a little bit of trouble as I'm moving to the end of this broad, to the broadcast here. What more can I talk about really? Really? What am I contributing anymore? If no one really is listening and no one wants to listen, I mean, folks, I mean, nobody follows my, we got what, 200 in what, how many years? Eight years? Followers? 100 somewhere else, somewhere else I got a 50, 100 someplace else. We get five, eight views on Twi on YouTube. Come on. No one's listening. I know that. You don't think I know it? that doesn't notice? No, that was notwithstanding. Now you got sound minds. Thank you very much for being over there. Thanks for the support and the sharing of the information to get it out. I don't know what that all means because I don't get no, not much feedback, but the point is it's out there. I can only hope the Couple of a couple of pieces of information strike where they need to strike, and they do what they need to do. Most of it just kind of goes down the toilet. And so we're not a society that's receptive. And that may have been my mistake, thinking that there was a society receptive to really. We here we can we can figure it out, folks. We can we can re regain some of the control that's been stolen from us. Literally, this, that property was stolen from us, and no one, no one wants to pay attention, and no one really cares. You'd rather make sensationalism stations. Oh, I go to Second Amendment. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll deny it. I'll resist, and don't know, don't know the first thing about it. Anyway, that's off point. Let's go. Yes, we make legislation where we can get in. We try to adjust things so that they get some measure of protection for people. We, I find the where the power actually sits, and your your constitution's working, folks. If you just would look, and it's in your local government. It really sits there. And the fire policy plan adjustment, in which it then gets adopted by a second county and then gets spread across the, the nation on how counties should deal with this problem of fire management instead of fire suppression, went across the nation. And I'm wondering how much that, because of how much the crews were jumping on now fire it's suppression for this year when it became an arson fest, I'm wondering really what the, I don't know, I have no, no data on this at all, whether or not the ability for people not to wait for the government to come, but actually be able to have the mentality a year before that they could go out and suppress fire again. Even though we saw a bad fire season, I'm wondering how much more was suppressed instead of just watched because we were able to do that. 
is like, I don't know the dominoes that we were able to relay and set up better in a better direction by actually j- jumping into what was a corrupt maladministration of the system, not a corruption of the system itself. And so our silence and our inaction, so I say, just find the place, just find the thing you want to make right, and then go there and do what you sense you need to do, is the only thing I can come up with to have us start to get active again, to stop the abuse. This COVID is a prime candidate for everyone, absolutely everyone. I, I've been looking, I've been wondering for like, I have, is there a shoe to drop on what I've been saying? No. It's going to go the way I've said, as I said before it got started. This is actually so predictable. When you get to where you, where I'm at in your perception, it's not just, oh, it's going to be corrupt. It's being there before and stopping before it gets corrupt. And if they one slips by you, you, you head it off at the pass anyway. Because you already understand the condition. I'd like to have you guys, anybody, just go read the petition, the Tulis petition. And look at the anticipatory defense part and think about how did how do you figure out how to anticipate what someone's going to say in answer and response to an allegation of wrongdoing how, how could all those pages be there to anticipate and then when the when the person the official comes to answer they fall right into that prediction is what something may be missed by people that is what I've been asking you to do when you know the battlefield. When you know the battlefield, you know where you're going to be abused. So you either work hard so that that doesn't come to fulfillment, which means you have to engage the implementation part, which is that government thing. The people in it, that have, the change agents that are in there to take you down. You either engage that in proper ways, or it takes you down. It incrementally takes you out. COVID has got it. I better move on because this is really more important. I hope you get the idea. This is not my choice. I'm finding it, this is the war that requires things that I normally wouldn't want to do or do normally is necessary to do. And so thank you for the question. I think, again, it's like a big deal. It's a big deal that people understand the system is corrupt because you're being quiet about the corruption. You can't just go in and say it's corrupt. You have to find out, literally find out the details on how. Not by your opinion, by how. And that's where I've come to the conclusion. Like I went to the forest, and this is just the most obvious thing on the single topics. I don't have to get all over the place. What else we do? The forest wildfire policy was written, black and white. It's a policy. So what? It's what they follow. Well, I read it. It happens to follow the establishment of, of Republican form representative government. The local county had actually had the power, notwithstanding the the theft of that by impl- by just request of the federal government. Once we got that fixed, it wasn't even rewriting the policy. It was getting the people's attitude correct, what the law was supposed to be, at the local level. That, requ- that also allowed us to seal that by making a policy, a land management policy change, which then refocused that policy, that land management policy, within the county in its reaction and interaction with the federal government so that that couldn't be breached anymore. Without that interaction, with that corrupt system, we wouldn't have had that. We wouldn't have had at least the two years of clear air in the summer and then the ability to have people go immediately suppress the fires instead of manage them when we got hit by the arsonists. So I don't know at one point where do we fall off? Where do we say it wasn't valuable? Where do we say, that oh, it's a corrupt system, so we put our hands up? My experience is we have to at this point. I don't know why it got here. I don't know how it got here. I just know that now we're here, and they're going to burn you out. They're going to starve you out. They're going to sick you out. They're going to lock you in is what they're going to do. They're going to keep you out of your life, and you're letting them because you think you're dealing with a corrupt. You're going to fix a corrupt system. I say go find the black and white. You see, that's, that's fixed. That's not even broken. What you're looking at is a breach of that framework that was sitting there to protect you if you understand, if you really understand what that was about. Am I saying the whole system is perfect? Absolutely not. That's certainly not what I'm talking about. We started in a broken system. This is where we find ourselves today, to the point where they have everybody locked down and no one wants to talk about it. 
Well, you'll complain about it, but you won't actually do that. I'm saying, when I say talk about it, I mean bring them behind the woodshed, that kind of talking. There was an obligation and duty. It was black and white. It was breached. Harmed, caused by the breach is your court case. I said it all right there. Now, is anybody going to follow through? I doubt it. All the like, two of you listening, thank you for those. Those of you that listen, thank you. I just hope that it keeps emanating out, emanating out, until we can find some people that really, really will step up. And I got need to move over because there's some really important stuff here. As I move in, I'm so I get so many things to really talk about. Only got two hours to do it. I get a bunch of tabs. Boy, last week I'm an overachiever. I had 20 tabs left over. That I didn't even get to. All integrated, but I never get to it. I'm sorry, it sounds mine for handing, uh, dumping all that on you without having any discussion. But if you go through it, you should see a theme. You should see a, a notice to you. You should see uh, things are going on. You should see answers, actually, in there. You should see things to do that we can start to do for ourselves. One of these things that's come up now, because it's going to get just more difficult. And we saw a bit of the censorship thing. I just want to hit it now, getting to the tabs. How to beat internet censorship and create your own news feed. This is an old technology, but with all the censorship going on and all the interferences and all the kinds of things, those of us of a, of a coherent uh, mindset to try and resolve the problems against us need to have a clear communication. And this article starts out with a statement about Event 201, World Economic Forum, Bill and, ben, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, COVID-19, Wuhan, China, it brings all that up. That's why I even got here. What I was more interested in is the point about creating your own news feed. Now, websites have the ability to do this, and, and the way this thing ends up working out, they go through why we need to have an alternative communication. This happens to be older technology, but it, it does work. I've kind of fallen away from it. It becomes too much for me to go through with all the things I'm doing, to keep up with some types of feed, but I notice, and I can't get into Twitter. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of get. It's like not. It's not even a beta thing anymore. It's so so inferior that it actually allows me to start thinking. We need to start working on how we can integrate uh, a communication, a news type cycling, that we get information, and and an RSS news feed, which is what they're asking people to start to do. Maybe older technology may be able to do that, and they say you can use the Thunder, Thunderbird browser, which will allow you to see a news feed. They also say move off of the free emails and go to ProtonMail or Tutanota. And so look at those carefully. You know, I've got a, behind, a mark on the beast at ProtonMail.com. Uh, I did that a little while back. I rarely use the Yahoo uh, thing I used to have. It's still, it's for most of the older references to the accounts that I've been on, like for notices. But for all y'all, I move. We move over to Proton, and uh, then that you do uh, Thunderbird. It says here and RSS feed. Uh, real RSS stands for real simple syndication. Sometimes rich site summary. It was origin origin was developed back in the 1990s during the infancy of the internet. It was originally called RDF, Resource Description Framework. Lots of words. What it is, it's just, a, just like a feed of news. You you subscribe to certain accounts. Don't know how this would work. I would actually like to see if someone could take RSS and make it look like a Twitter. So it's a little bit more uh, graphical, I guess. Yeah, I like cartoons, I suppose. I like pictures. Anyway, just make it so that it's you could pull in feeds. And as I say that, I'm reminded, I think, Ray from uh, Revolution Broadcasting, the first network I was on, he said, if we knew, if you, had, you could build a, a, a program, that actually would take feeds from all over. You could have so much information coming into a database if you if you if people wanted to. But so that just reminded me. That's the kind of thing I guess I'm thinking here again. Here, how many years later, we may have to find ways to keep the censorship ship down that we can learn to like you would say. I'm going to follow somebody. You just subscribe to an RSS feed that goes to people that you know that are looking at the same things that you are. Uh, and so we, but we have a, a line of communication for information as a, as a, a suggestion. I'm not sure of all the technology there. All I know is that with the censorship happening and the interference that's going on and the control that's going on, and that's helping to bring us society into a, in, to down, to destroy the, the society, even if you don't respond against it, 
it, it it's, still, it's still going to be important to have information so that you can maybe not stand in the road when the bus comes by. If if you have the if that's an option, but they don't track you down and run you over anyway. Baltimore halts sky uh, uh, plane uh, spy plane flights as uh, programs fails to reduce homicide. Which right from the beginning, I've never understood how an airplane in the sky was going to stop a homicide. But at any rate, this is what uh, this is the military intelligence, I suppose, working in your local police department in Baltimore. All flight operations for the Baltimore spy plane program will be canceled today. Uh, this was October 31st. A Baltimore City Police spokesman told a radio, uh, some TV station, grounding of, of the spy plane comes uh, as surveillance flights uh, failed to deter violent crime in the metro area. Uh, you can read it. You can see what the, how these minds of these, uh, these uh, geniuses in government work uh, to waste your money, to waste your time, to surveil you, to take information, and uh, none of that works out a- at all anyway. And so those of you that are working in kind of confining the cops so they don't aren't everywhere knowing everything you take this and you walk in and you say this is going to stop i'm not we're not going to tolerate this no more you gain the night you, you gain an ally inside the decision makers first you have to find out whether or not they're change agents if they are you're going to have a real difficult time then you got to understand they're talking to attorneys all that they're they are the change agents and they have a really big they have a big club that they wield against the the, the seats of decision you put in election and that was another thing that goes on that you have to fight. You have to actually, like I said, you have to look through your problem. You're going to be not even talking to the people you talk to. The people you talk to that, that you can influence, they have to talk to others when you can't be there. And so you have to be able to anticipate for the, protect the ones you talk with against the mis- maladministration or the misadvising of these uh, those that are you're talking to. This is kind of how this devolves out. That spend a lot of money operating airplanes not cheap then the program that it was to do this computer program AI they find out it, it doesn't work and yet they implemented it and they implemented it until somebody was able to stop it it just this one happened probably be so costly but all the things they do in AI is computers is not so costly anymore that they continue it. and so again this is a problem where we can sit back and let it happen. We oh yeah oh surveillance and we do nothing about it. Though somebody in Baltimore, we've had a problem with the cops. This is one of those things. This is also gives you the ability to say, well you made that wrong uh, wrong decision. How about let's here we got a couple more. It gives you an opening. If you don't want the cops killing you, get rid of their ability to do so or bring liability, bring remedy to the people. Take away that immunity. Take away this nonsense that goes on under cover of some like they saw they say crime fighting it, it isn't that's that's a fr- that's a fraud that's just a pre a tense and if you can bring that's a fraud so a fraud would vitiate that decision if you bring it out and you have support for it if you don't these things continue in this case this one's ending good good riddance for it but there's going they've wor- worked out some more things to they learn from what this is they'll not do it this way they've learned something else i suspect and they're doing it other ways and you've heard since the implementation of that program so many other things have come up we have these things you know the license plate readers and all that they're doing it on the ground they have the cops running around and so anyway this is how they they found out they can't stop homicide from the sky and you're going to find out they they can't stop anything and if they're only going to be report takers as well and therefore, they also can't predict. And so you find that the, your co- if you think clearly on this, you start finding that the cops are confining themselves out of utility, and that may be one of your other options to start asserting. There is no place for the cops, certainly not in the capacity that they are. My, a little thing that comes into my mind always, notice very carefully that the cops will fine you or get you for some something that mostly when they already, they're, they're interacting with you, they're de- now, homicide's a capital crime type thing. I mean, it's you know, harm, harm dead. But, but actually, the implementation, when they go to card readers, uh, uh, car readers on the, bo- on the license plate readers, that's somebody in commerce. You'll know, even in drugs, the same thing. They treat you more like a drug dealer than they did just a u- user. And if you look very carefully, that's what the charges make out. They make it out look like you were dealing drugs. You were in the commerce, trafficking in the drug. And that's what the 
That's what the regulation is supposed to be over. All That's what I've told you before. None of this stuff for use should actually be needing to be done, but they're doing it because they get away with it, and then they get to control you by it and derive money, which we're going to find out here as they're looking, this plane comes out of the ground. Well, don't don't forget they got tons of more surveillance that they put in 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 the city, your light standards and wherever. Uh, still looking at you now now on the ground, but uh, don't don't forget about that one. But here, Oregon, in this last week, decriminalizes possession of street drugs, becoming first in the nation. Now this was all predicted to want to be coming happening through uh, the international sphere, into influencing yourself, so don't uh, influencing your your country. So don't underestimate the actual foreign influence here that they claim came from the New York-based Drug Policy Alliance. Okay, it came from New York. What's interesting is this came from New York, but it's influencing all the way across the country to show you the reach. And if you study the two, the two states, New York to Oregon, you'll find a historic connection through time and the bar associations and attorneys moving through Chicago, which is another key place, and then into Oregon to then put, I think it was 1893, to put their influence there. So they hop skipped all the way across in the West and became the cancer early on in the West Coast that way. Interesting to me that New York-based uh, drug policy alliance is involved to, to so-called decriminalize. Well, okay, fine. This just is to, uh, they say here, Oregon made the history Tuesday to in the movement to reconsider the nation's war on drugs by becoming the first state to decriminalize small amounts of heroin and other street drugs. Again, decriminalization is not what you want. I'm not a drug advocate. I'm not, I just never found great utility. I know lots of people do. Uh, anyway, that's just my experience has not been that I look around and it didn't ever intrigue me. However, there's important to a lot of people, and under lockdown it probably increased, and probably why they went to prohibition on alcohol, because people resort to these things. And the only thing I would resort to alcohol typically is something chemical or something for herbs or something like that. It's a, it's a tool, another tool for doing things, but it's not something I, I, I'm interested in. However, there's a war on drugs that's been used as a pretense to destroy people. Everyone, all of you, and put you under scrutiny and give probable cause to the cops to come kill you and do things like, oh, there's homicides in an area. We're going to use an airplane to surveil everybody. You don't think that's the only information that they were taking down? I don't know how many other people might have got dra pulled in dragnets and actually accused innocently that had to deal with all that. Anyway, so Oregon is going to now, is now decriminalized. So they reduce the penalties. It's more like a traffic ticket, interestingly trafficking see it's still the same type of charge it's still a traffic and commerce charge it's not the actual just private use charge now here's the thing about this everyone that might be involved great for most people they don't talk about this stuff because it doesn't matter for the people that take drugs it means that there's going to be less abuse to them by the system the gut the system won't be able to derive so much benefit of, of control and money from these people either. But the trade-off was a couple of things. It's actually implementing the foreign view of drugs. And also drugs can bring your, your society down. It, it's, a tr it's a fact of how that works. Not everybody is really responsible in this. So that's the problem. And it's not to say, oh, you got to be, you got to control to force responsibility. It's just, no, even if you just relax it, the, it actually lifts because there's no pressure. So it actually works in reverse, but but that's not. I'm not talking about the saying that there should be a control. I'm saying it's not a, a panacea. This addictive stuff is not a is dealing with. It's not. There's no panacea for it. We again have to rise up as people to be responsible to ourselves and to each other in some regard. Life can be tough for people, but not to get off. So Oregon's going to decriminalize. So they still have a finger in it. It's just not. It's going to be like a trafficking ticket now. Like it was still in, see, it's still in traffic. And yet what I noticed at the end of this story was how they're going to fund it. They're going to fund a funding. And I told you the marijuana legalization had different a different reason than to hand you all the right to grow or to use marijuana or sell it. And at the end of this story, they actually tell us now they're going to tap taxation of marijuana to fund treatment Offering treatment now, which is an international imposition, and I think it might be fair enough 
the reasons that they used in Europe, I think, are different than how they translate here in the United States because this leveraged funding now from taxation on a production, which is no different than taxing your how your home and land taxes, is diverted to those that will create treatment centers, which are which are these agenda driven services. Okay? And so they're going to tap now. The thing they should have never le legalized by by making marijuana legal, they should have stopped regulating it at all, and leave it a production plant, and stop the nonsense, to stop the war. See, the, the war doesn't end because they decriminalize either. It just sits there with this double layer, federal and state. But they now tax production of, of uh, marijuana, which now forever is going to burden the production of marijuana forever, and you'll never free it up, ever. And so, be, again, production is not supposed to be touched. They're going ahead and doing it. You're allowing it. Now they're tying and pulling down uh, worse, the, the more, uh, and these are troubling drugs, I mean, to the point, heroin, I've had, I've had a, a couple friends really tell, and they didn't, I got, they survived heroin, I guess I should say that, and a lot of their friends didn't, so it's not like I want to even want to hear about this. However, the, the reality is the government's even worse at how this works, and it seems that when you relieve it, people aren't so, aren't, it's like when you keep people from something, they want more of it, like little kids, little goats, you know, want to go play. But the whole point about this is control. They have now are going to fund the decriminalization with those that are growing, taxing those that are growing marijuana, and it now fixes this. The government will never, ever give that up. It will never be a free production. If this was thought, if people thought this was going to step people into freeing up marijuana, this I told you years and years ago when the first bills came, I said, be careful, this is set up by, by industry and government to tax it. And here we have one of the first uses was to decriminalize other drugs in order to lock in the need for taxing marijuana growing. And that's control. And taxing them moves it into not production, but into secondary manufacture, which is also a felony. But no one pays any attention to this. So, at any rate, those in Oregon are going to have, you're not going to get, uh, there's not so much impetus to, to, to get you. If you're doing drugs, they also going to offer help, which I think is important. Also, it's not a it's not a good thing. These addictions are not a good thing. But to tax the pay have marijuana pay for it is a whole other game that they're playing that I think maybe people miss. Moving over here now, the ignorance and deception surrounding the PCR test for COVID-19 is now becoming more of a a general knowledge. Patrick Wood writing again from Technocracy News. I agree with uh, Patrick Wood's statements. He's all over this. Uh, sustainable development nonsense. Uh, and so just to let you know, for those of you that are moving this along, it's becoming wider. I told you you're on the right hand side of history. If you move this forward, the ignorance and deception surrounding PCR tests is not behind the woodshed or anybody listening, if you've been paying attention, but it's now coming to a wider audience than behind the woodshed. And he has, uh, Patrick Wood has insights that we go through and start to restate about this PCR test, which is a lie. The word the, the name, the res designation is a lie. It's not a test. It's a research technique. It's a tool in a research lab. No, never plan to be at all in a clinical condition. And again, this this becomes the real subtle, uh, it's a subtle enticement, inducement to say, to just leave PCR tests is igno ha has ignorance and deception. The ignorance, deception, and fraud is it's a test at all. And I get, I, my mind just keeps saying, boy, I get settled when I say that because once you focus on that, there is no test. And you realize all the officials are saying so. You caught them in the fraud just by entering the room to say, hey, culprit, put your hands, put your hands up. We're going to arrest this right now. And until someone does walk in the room and say that, you don't even begin to get close to being able to have them under arrest their lie and their fraud. And so, again, I just wanted to point out the expanding uh, uh, um, idea. There's a different way to explain the same thing I've been telling you for months and months. 
It's moving into, importantly, it's moving into the technocracy issue. That's sustainable development because you'll find, again, if you go back to the Tulis petition, you read right in there uh, that this is all connected. There's a way to connect it. And uh, I should say to plausibly connect it because that's all a petition has to do. It doesn't have to, it can show the proof. It it's, uh, itself is an allegation. It has to plausibly connect, which I think you'll see is the evidence. You could click the links and read it all for yourself. So as it's becoming a wider, see, this is the other, the danger of this is everyone saying that the, the, the ignorance and the deception, thinking that if you're not ignorant and there's no, de, and, and, and you've figured out the deception, that you've answered the problem. No, you haven't. You just come to the point where you can start looking to see what limit, what's the limit of your acknowledgement of your now non-ignorance and what part of the deception did you catch and did you catch it all? And then how do you stop it? What are you going to do? What action do you take? And I've been offering a couple throughout the months and months behind the woodshed, hoping beyond hope that we would step up as a society and not be enamored by the clowns and circuses that are around us and focus in. And we're not really doing that. But at any rate, so we have another view on this. We can go through and read the, read the report, how uh, Patrick Wood will describe it. I'm saying we'll, we'll use this as a more confirmation of the fact you're going to need more information. You'll need to know more of the thing. You need to step into that corrupt system to stop, to expose it for its corruption, notwithstanding that it doesn't want to hear it. And again, that Tennessee case, uh, the court doesn't want to hear it, and there and it's being another type of battle which is being dealt with. And I, uh, it's kind of funny to me. I, I liken it to Chinese finger cuffs. If the petition is right, they stick their fingers in the cuffs, and then they think they can pull out of them with the normal evasions. They get caught. They can't. And you're there to witness it. Whatever, whatever else, whatever else goes on, you witness that in formal form, before the whole world, for everybody. Not as opinions and being able to describe how others are ignorant or how anybody could be ignorant. No, you catch the culprit that's using your ignorance against you in the black and white. It's not even opinion what we're talking about. I'm never talking in my opinion about the PCR. It's a, it's a fraud used outside of a research setting. That's it. They don't know what anybody relying on one is committing fraud. Now, what they've tried to do is they've said, oh, we're going to use this as part. Now they're realizing, when they went to read, I suppose, they realized maybe they're listening behind the woodshed. They needed more, so they kind of throw more out there, but it's still a fraud as well because you can't do any of the rest until you do the first. But they'll throw lots of smoke in the room and obscure the view, so you can, you don't know who's in the room if there's anyone or that they're there and who what they're doing to arrest them. And your properly state your proper statements in the proper form are like a big fan that clear the room out, and they can't avoid that. They'll only evade, and that can be caught up. It's really it's just this finger cuffs problem. There's no way they're going to get out of those things once they. They they put their fingers in it, and you they do that, but you actually put their fingers in it when you when you call out the fraud. You literally have the audacity to enter into their corruption, call out the corruption you're going to be involved in, and then identify the corruption that they are, and they fall right into it. Now we need a lot of information. Apparently, people are coming together. It is you know it's not no one's not working, but it seems to be more information side. For me, I don't need much more information myself. But lots of people seem to need information. They seem they, they they think if they have a basket big enough, then all of a sudden they'll have enough faith and conviction to move forward. It has nothing to do with that for me. However, that's what people need to see. There are people bringing information together. One place is called the Global Repository for Research into Collateral Effects of the COVID-19 Lockdown Measures. That's actually off point. But you'll need to know this if they can blow past the first part when you say they were derelict to implement the law, the statute that required them to find the infectious agent, determine its source, determine its infection, its infect, infectivity, its uh, transmissibility, someone's uh, susceptibility, those things are all there to do. They failed. Without the knowledge of which, without which knowledge, they have no way to make anything that would talk to the effects. All effects would end up on this website because they'll all be wrong. They don't even know what they're dealing with, and they're just essentially practicing medicine without a license. 
in the in the minor administrative regard. But so I give you a link here for more information to the Global Repository for Research into Collateral uh, Effects on COVID-19, as well as regarding the surveillance that's coming on and the of all this health of surveillance, as well as this other surveillance they were trying to do in the homicides from the airplane. No, they're getting it right down it, right down around your around your ankles here, and so they're going to bring it to the ground here. Uh, there's also another effort, you know, uh, called it's at the Atlas of Surveillance uh, that shows things. Law enforcement surveillance isn't always a secret. These technologies can be discovered in news articles and government meeting agendas and company press releases and social media. It just hasn't been aggregated before. And this is the RSS aggregates. This is an aggregator. It just pulls information together. Oh, I guess the RSS becomes a corporation then, doesn't it? Right, Grimner? Is that right? RSS aggregation, aggregation is corporation. You see, it, that's why I'm just trying to point out you can word, use these words interchangeable. Sometimes they're not so dangerous and scary. We can expand our vocabulary, but we will definitely have to put that vocabulary in work in the right place. And this is critical in this COVID issue. So here we have another, with all the surveillance coming on, we're having a, a Electronic Frontier Foundation supporting uh, with the University of Nevada, uh, at school at Reynolds School of Journalism, the database that you might be able to use to look at what the types of surveillance are around you for whatever your interest is re regarding so-called law enforcement. So, again, here's information. What are you going to do about it? If you think the system is corrupt, I don't know about how a database can be corrupt of information that you need to protect yourself. If you think that a corrupt system is something you don't want to engage in, then you're just going to allow the crime to continue. It's really there's a duty in society, whether people want to agree with that or not, and this or not. We have a duty to arrest all crime around us, and there's a wisdom behind that. If you don't, then it continues and gets worse. This is a violation to people that do drugs that don't harm anybody. They're not harming anybody. There should not be something that the state then has its hooks in for you. You see, though, they didn't relieve it. They just decriminalized it. Keep the hooks in. They still ruin your records and stuff. People can still look in, but it's still, and it's still in commerce, but people look that over. Because what? The, the, we, the, the marijuana growers are going to pay for it. Oh, win-win, they say. Don't realize what that's actually doing in society and how the foreign agenda just got more empowered by all that. Whether people see that's a foreign agenda, I don't know. I can certainly get a direct line to it. So anyway, two, uh, two more databases pop up. You get links at the blogcaster when I post it for you to engage if you need information. I've asked, I've wondered why we don't have more of these, these uh, types of databases in all kinds of different subject matters. And maybe we could aggregate all that. So it's just a matter of us pulling together uh, to help those uh, people that want to either need information. I ask, we have to go more than information. At some point, you know enough. You really do. Because, let me put it this way, if I find a statute that was not followed, to even giving them a little license for error, just a little bit, just go ahead and, okay, they, they dropped this, this bit and this bit, but they didn't do the core thing, and you don't say anything, you let them continue. But how hard is it really to watch and say, well, they had five things to do. This black and white says they have five things to do. And they didn't do any of them. Does it require that I know anything about PCR? Does it require that I don't I know anything about medicine or what COVID is or what it isn't or any of that? All I know is I don't see the evidence of compliance with this black and white thing that the legislature wrote down for this official to do is really all you have to do. All that I talk about reduces to that. We took enough interest to go look at the health code to see what the duties and obligations of a health official was, and that health official hasn't produced any evidence. And this is what I tell you. The first letter you send when you set up your record is that you demand evidence. You're not making a, a request for information. See, there's tons of information. You want evidence of compliance. And that's what you demand. And this is hard for people to get. They, people want to reduce what I'm saying into something else. Oh, it's, a, it's like a FOIA if it went federal. 
Well, I want to do it for you. No, you get stuck into these endless loops of delay. You turn that into a document, an evidence demand for a purpose of remedy, and all of a sudden it changes its tenor and it changes its purpose. It changes the whole dynamic, actually. Now, you can't be lazy on that request. You better be moving. You better have a plan when you put that in effect, when they come back with a lie or they don't respond. You use that. You rely that they didn't produce evidence of compliance. I don't have to know endless amounts of information. I don't have to care what the surveillance of the cops is. I don't have to know what the CDC is. I Nothing. I don't have to know any of that stuff. All I want to know is show me the evidence of compliance with this black and white right here. Now, if, you, if anybody thinks engaging that is engaging a corrupt system, well, you're missing it. You're right in one regard, but you're missing it. Yes, it's engaging the corrupt system, but on a basis that's not refutable. And it's not your burden. You don't have to prove they don't have evidence. They have to produce it because the statute underneath they've promised and pledged to operate requires that they do. That's all the notice they need. That's all the reliance you need to take. There's nothing to know. In fact, your ignorance becomes your power. Boy, if people get this, if people would just get what I just said, it's not that you're ignorant. It's you're ignorant of a duty that was, if someone accepted, undertook. That's their problem. And that's all this whole thing really boils down to for trying to get this thing in the most simplest terms to get people to understand how easy it is to start to engage to protect themselves. Are you going to walk into a big obstructive wall? Yeah, absolutely. But it's not the wall you may have to dig out from underneath if you know what to anticipate. Then I'll just say it again. Go look at the petition at Tula's report in Tennessee. It sets up a whole bunch of stuff. But all you need to know is that the they, they didn't produce evidence. I'm not looking for information now. I'm not looking for a database. I'm looking for what the statute said it's supposed to already be. So if we can get rid of some of this obscurity we put in our mind to create excuses, if we can get rid of the flip the idea or actually embrace the idea that, yes, we're entering the corrupt system because the establishment's not corrupt, it's, the, we, it's the, those that are in it that are corrupt. And we're after those people. Look very carefully at that petition. It accepts the due process that was required of the health official that the legislature created, the failure of which is now not your problem more than now it's harming you, you declare the harm, and it's objectively declared. You don't, this isn't your opinion. And where it becomes a question, you might, we might even get some, some justice. A judge just dethroned the California COVID dictator, Gavin Newsom, as this article at PJ Media states and starts out, Gavin Newsom may want, to ma may want to mask up for the news. The California governor was just dethroned by a superior court judge who reminded him on Monday that he's not a king, but a servant of the people, people who elected a legislature to make laws. There's your judiciary stepping up, saying the legislature make a law. This law happens to be an emergency law. This is a little different than what's uh, happening in Tennessee. Uh, this is more akin to some other states' challenges uh, relative to the emergency clause, the emergency acts. And we found, what, was that Michigan, 1945? Since 1945, it's been illegal, unconstitutional all that time. Well, this one's not even doing all that. That just says, is, even though underneath the emergency, you can't become a dictator. You might want to look into this one. You might want to see the logic behind it. You see the structure of the government. It's not the corrupt, corruption. It's this guy who has exceeded his authority. And part of the analysis is the exceedance, understanding the limitation. The thing I did at the fire, well, National Wildfire Fire Policy, it said right in it, the local officials, the count, the local government has, has the, shall have the, the, the final say or the, the, the determination. Well, if that's the case, then what's everyone else talking for? And so we, we can see that this, this emergency act didn't give him the right to be a dictator. The judge come back and say it. So here's evidence we can get, even this corrupt system, we can get a good decision. And it's going to take a lot of people because, I can just tell you, we don't know where the good jurisdictions are. Just, they seem everywhere, and they are kind of everywhere, but they're not everywhere. 
look how the go find the complaint here for those of you that are interested. Go find out what happened in that court in California for that judge uh, to come out. Now, this is just Superior Court. I guess it could be appealed. The point is, is that you're seeing inroads of limitation. It is limited form. We're not enjoying that as much. Isn't a, a, a to me an excuse to say it's corrupt and therefore we can't we can't utilize it or engage it. it. That's been why it's turned corrupt because we we didn't in a system designed. We were born into yes we were born into it that was said we had to keep we had to keep that that containment. And there's every evidence about how that works, notwithstanding any corruption that even that I might consider. Uh, to me, uh, that I have to go for myself as far and, and wide and, and deep as I go to get justice tells me we got a corruption. We shouldn't have to work this hard. Like I say about the miners, you got a title and a property and you got the ultimate property title to it and to the exclusion of even the United States government itself that has the power to dispose it to you and we have problems, there's a corruption. There's a basic corruption. And so, here's a here's a court case. Judge dethrones. Boy, that's a big title. Good good for PJ, too. Dethrones the dictator, king, people, godmen stepping up. Not the rule, O law. Law ruling. And this, and it doesn't get, a, if they hadn't made this lawsuit, entered into that corrupt system to try and get the answer, this would not have popped out. Yes, there's no guarantees. It's that corrupt. But if you don't, it's like, how do you win the lottery when you don't play it? It took me years to figure out that why I wasn't winning the lottery, folks. Come on. Six months in prison. Now, this is the other side of the story, the other side of the country. Six months in prison for Michigan businesses that don't surveil customers. And this starts in my thought, my theme here about moving into it's not going away. I don't care what anybody was thinking. I've told you it's not going away. It's not because I have an opinion and I'm paranoid and, oh, you just don't think good of the government. No, there's some cool things in this in the establishment that we're not exercising. God is here. But there are some real evil in the government. And this Michigan is one of those places. And I've told a couple people, you better get your habeas set up and going. You better really challenge this because this one is not going to shut down. And this is indicative of all the places like California, just like no, it's like a mirror here, that are going to press the bitter end until you get someone into a place that can end it. Six months now in prison for businesses. See, they attack the commerce as well, if you notice. And this starts that third-party problem. You walk into a business, and they're looking at this kind of a problem, and they just, just give me your name, or you can't be here. And then you can't go shopping. And that's building into that digital what? That digital social credit, whether or not you can, uh, you don't even need money now, right? you got digital digital digits for currency, and they can, uh, you don't have that mark. You don't have your star on your chest. You don't have that, your papers. You don't have the code, the UPC code. You don't have the right thing in your possession. You don't get to buy or sell, for those of you that have been watching this come up. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, now That's you got to understand, too, in statutes, they specifically name different entities. you got to keep track of that, and that depends on where your demands will go and who you might sue and who you won't. I, I tend to believe you sue the guy, the governor, because he's actually, he led, the, he or she, the governors led this before they were actually able to, and then months and months later, the public, local health public official, the health official got involved, which should have actually been the beginning, and they got this thing all inverted, and no one caught that. And so they have these uh, local officials, you have the state official, and then you have this governor, and then you might have some minions in between. You want to just find, like, the bookends. The local one that was supposed to determine, and the uh, and the upper one. Now, the middle one, your Michigan Department of Health, may be the go-between, and you want to write your, it's a simple addition to a letter or an adjustment, that you look Coming and going, what did they receive to them and what did they transmit out? If you're trying to then to prove out the linkage of information that they'll try to come and claim they've done, that hasn't been done. And so there's a way to use the middleman, if you will, here. But you're really going to be suing the one who did the initial orders and the one that had the duty that didn't, that he was supposed to, or he or she was supposed to rely on. This governor's not relying on anything, even after that court case says that she doesn't have power. This is the future, folks, coming down. 
Anyway, so if you're in a business, it doesn't matter. They have a whole list of businesses. An establishment that does not comply uh, with uh, to aid with contact tracing is threatened with a maximum $200 fine and misdemeanor charge punishable up to six months in prison and a $1,000 civil fine for violating the state's emergency orders. Now, I don't know what law they're using for these emergency orders, but this is the how the dictator happens. Nobody shut it down. And when the judiciary stepped up, she still. This is how how criminal she is. That she'll go against the the establishment itself. That's not a corrupt government. That's an official that's corrupt. And there's a couple of other things that could come on to her this way as well. But if no one's going to rise up because you you don't want to deal with a corrupt system, she will reign supreme. And there's going to be people that are either going to jail or going to be creating conflict, disturbing the peace between and private contracting and association between businesses and their customers and relationships in those businesses for the business not doing the civic contact tracing, which is another type of problem for private privacy under the color of a health crisis, is going to get worse. You see, I'm telling you, the news telling you where, where you're going, folks. And Michigan's literally now the, the tip of this spear. If you thought that maybe Australia was on its own and not going to happen, well, I told you it's spreading. Well, here it is. It's spreading right here now. And she's the one that somehow thinks that she's going to get away with it. This is, be, this is actually kind of really concerning to me when they get this bold. A lot of times they'll back off and they get, they get a, a, what it's called, evasive. This one's getting right in everybody's face. And so, Michigan, look, heads up, those that are looking at this and the COVID thing, or any any governmental indis, governmental infringement, again, to me, COVID's just, just a model. If you can see how this works, you can attack every other uh, problem in the government that exceeds black and white guidance, black and white constraint. Now, I don't know how you can say the government's corrupt when there's a statute that says that to protect you all, an official has to verify, certify, find, determine an actual causation for a health crisis and doesn't. I don't see how you can say you're entering in a corrupt system, so you're not going to enter it at all. It sounds to me like the system was supposed to be just fine. It's someone wielding that, that, that their election without arrest that's causing the problem, that is waiting for someone to step in that corrupt system. That none if none of you do like they wouldn't have got in California if someone didn't go somewhere to a superior court and try to find the judge that would do exactly what that judge did, say your emergency may be there. You have to understand what they impliedly agreed to, too, is still a fraud. So I'm not totally sold on the California decision, but the judge did come out and say, no, you're not a dictator under emergency laws and rules. What did I tell you back way back when like, Washington destroyed their whole state by telling you you couldn't go to the judiciary? I said, your remedies are gone, your laws are finished. You don't even have a government. And yet you were all silent. It's fascinating to me. I'm just really fascinated. But anyway, here it is. It's coming down on people. They're going to use the force of government. They're going to use the power to hurt you. Wherever you walk, the cops show up and say that that order was right, even though the Supreme Court of Michigan said it's un it has no emergency power whatsoever. I'm, I'm flabbergasted at some level, but it's a scary thing. And, and what's forcing, what's helping this is there's stuff in your statutes, and now I'm finding in the rules that allow for foreign influence, not federal influence. It comes from the CDC. And John Rapport comes out again to give us advance notice. If, if uh, those of you that haven't heard about this, some of us, we just see that, uh, to me, it's just a stream of information that, that's there that I find I run through. And well, how much can you do with information? So it's, to me, it's just tons of information sitting there. He highlights it. So let's highlight that today. CDC document. This is what the things the state is using as a supposed appropriate medical expert is the CDC information. Think about this when we talk experts and what they're going to say in this document. He opens up with this uh, CDC plans COVID concentration camps. Everyone thinks, oh, that's hyperbole and this and that. Well, you got to go read the document. 
CDC, a do document entitled Interim Operational Considerations for Implementing the Shield Approach to Prevent COVID-19 Infections in Humanitarian Settings. If that didn't internationalize it, humanitarian settings. Now they're setting themselves up as godmen again to help people. Well, I'll go on the second paragraph and then move from there to the document. As you read them and realize the horrific plan, keep in mind that this system can be manipulated to order anyone into these camps. This is America? So, let me, John has his own highlights. I'm just going to pull a couple things. Folks that are all over 65 or so, whatever the risk area, the risk age group is, you need to listen up. If you think you're going to skinny out of this thing anytime soon, you better listen here very carefully. Folks, I've been talking to all y'all that have had a wisdom in the world about you're next. The baby boomers, you ain't getting out without some suffering. They're taking the pensions. They're taking the, they're putting, they're going to get rid of their liabilities. It's in this plan. Go to the plan. It's got a link there. Read about it, folks. Don't turn away from the horror. Literally here, folks. I'm not, this is not sensationalism. I, I, I'm blown away it even got this far, but here it is. This document that he refers to presents considerations, considerations, listen to the hesitation and the lack of authority here, prancing around as authority to come and take you out, those of you in risk, in the risk groups. And I said, watch for age, you get too, too much. They're going to tell you they're coming for everybody in this document, just as John points out, although he starts someplace else in the document. I just want you to know about it. I want you to hear that it's on your doorstep, whether you sense that or not. The worst way they can come at you, they are. They're exploiting your crookedness. This document presents considerations from the perspective of the U.S. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention for implementing the shielding approach in humanitarian settings. As outlined in the guidance documents focused on camps, displaced populations, and low-resource settings. So now that after they put your whole system into low-resource assets, now they say they have power to do this on top of it all for efficiency's sake? Go down a little farther. The purpose of this document is to highlight potential implementation challenges of the shielding approach from CDC's perspective and guide thinking around implementation in absence of empirical data. Absence of empirical data. They're starting without empirical data. They, the only data they have is the one they fabricate. Potential implementation challenges in implementing the shielding is already an idea. It's in the works. And any obstruction to it, they're going to work that out. This is what I was telling you. Is the way they work this out. I've been talking about this for years and years. It's right here in this document. Without empirical data, they think this is going to work. Considerations are based on current evidence known about the transmission and severity of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, and may need to be revised as more information becomes available. What's that evidence they have, folks? It's self-referential fraud which is known. Why? Because coronavirus cannot do, it's not, they didn't say novel coronavirus here. Don't miss these, the omission, the silence in this statement. Just the common cold is now a disease. Given COVID-19 designation, we're not even talking influenza like we were last week. The transmission and severity of the disease of which is not novel, not subject to this kind of control to begin with, and common. That they have no clue about. It just happens. Yeah? So, if you don't see the open-ended problem you're facing that I've been telling you is on your doorstep, it's standing right outside the doorstep that you're locked inside of, here is the document that John highlights for us. What is the shielding approach? 
The shielding approach aims to reduce the number of severe COVID cases by limiting contact between individuals at higher risk of developing severe disease, quote, high risk, and general population, quote, low risk. High risk individuals would be temporarily relocated to safe or green zones established at the house, neighborhood, camp, sector, or community level, depending on the context and setting. Footnotes available. I won't go there. You read this. Going down one more paragraph. Current evidence indicates that older adults and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions are at higher risk to severe illness of co for COVID-19. Of all the things that comes to mind about that addition now, Remember, I told you they were taking the comorbidities and blending them together. They were moving the COVID into Ill communicable and non-communicable disease. That statement is right there. And now I want to ask you, how do they identify a serious underlying medical condition? In the future, it's going to be because your record in digital form in your phone they'll have tattooed to your behind. Is going to say so. It'll tattle against you. Right now, how do they know? Well, they know by statistics. And how did they create COVID? But by symptoms. And how did they do HIV? By clinical observation, subjective. Should start worrying you just a little bit here on how they're going to now attach any age with serious underlying medical conditions. Which to me, brought up, well, if I've had a vaccine schedule, I might be one of those people because what we know and they know, their documents tell you, that you become more susceptible to things like the common cold, don't you? They cause your problem. Munchausen syndrome by proxy. As an appropriate medical expert creating the problem which, which they're going to blame you for so they can come in and solve it. Just like climate change. Your human humanitarian carbon footprint you. Because these higher risks are now claimed to be a small percentage, they think they can take that population and relocate them to green zones. Sounds like some Middle Eastern military camp, doesn't it? Moving down a little bit further. For this reason, the shielding approach suggests physically separating high-risk individuals from the general population to prioritize the use of limited available resources and avoid implementing long-term containment measures among the general population. Now, right there, does, you, does anybody, have anybody clicked into this a bit at all to understand the dynamic or not? If you aren't listening, you just like listen to me talk, we're not getting there. We aren't going to get there, and this is going south. And I don't mean the south will rise again that south. I'm talking this is not going good. You realize they don't, the CDC has no authority, first of all. Secondly, they aren't have, there's no state law that allows containment measures for the general population. The rules, even the rules and the law say it's to be for sick people only. And then with due process. But this so-called appropriate medical expert in one state, that shall have preferential and prevailing discussion in this, already assumes that their plan is in the works, they can pull this off, and they can do it to the general population. But for this plan, they won't do it to the general population. We're going to get a few of you, just going to be happening to be the weakest among you and the oldest. We're going to go after, we're going to get rid of our pension liability in the government. And we're going to go about it and we're going to get rid of some of our heavy-duty health care problems with this as well. In theory, shielding may serve its objective, may serve its objective. Don't miss the apprehension to protect high-risk populations from disease and death. I find that fascinating because this mask that they say you're supposed to wear says it can cause harm, disease, and death. And they make you wear it. So, totally incongruous with what they're supposed to be doing because they came in with authority they don't have and you're not going to engage it because they're corrupt. Is really, I don't even know what the word is. What's the word for that? Oh, I'm, they're corrupt, so I'm not going to protect myself. Absurd, folks. Absurd. 
absurd. They're corrupt, so I'm not going to protect myself. Absurd. Is that how simple that was? Boy, of all the things that just flash in my head. I'm just talking, folks. It comes to my mind as I'm talking. I don't even make this up before. I don't plan it. I just put the tabs to talk about stuff. I don't even know how I'm going to get there. But out comes this stuff. Is that what the whole problem is? You don't want to protect yourself because the system is corrupt? Wow. However, implementation of the approach necessitates strict adherence to protocol. Talk about a military camp. Talk about a detention camp. Concentration camp. They say camp here. Go down next paragraph. See guidance for the prevention of COVID-19 infections among high-risk individuals in low-resource, displaced, and camp and camp-like settings. For details. I think that's about all I'm going to read there. To me... I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a little bit soft. That terrifies me without being terrified because uh, I can see it. It terrifies me that you're sitting there quiet as crickets when this is on the plan. This is being implemented. This is a presumption of action they're already taking. Have you seen it? No. This is already there, though. And when you see people like Michigan governor doing what they're doing, and then you read this, you shouldn't really pay it pay more attention to anything else. And I'm glad that the election cycle is done. Maybe we can get back to business, the business of protecting ourselves. And this document goes on and on and on about this implementation that they want to do, the theory, shielding, taking away your family, your grandmother, your grandfather, anybody older, and putting them in a safe zone and strict adhering to protocols of separation. Sounds like a master plan for felonious abuse to me under color of a fraudulent, of a health crisis that is actually a fraudulent claim. And none of you are stopping it. None of you are stepping up even to protect others. This is going to go against people. The elderly, elderly have no capacity here. To, to help protect themselves. So if I can appeal to even some people that want to help others, this is why you have to get involved. The plan is right here. What they want to do is right here. And it, it comes in the form of a pseudo-authorities that are given license underneath rules to be su appropriate, which, if you go again back to the Tennessee petition, attacks that by the demand to say there's rules here that give these people that are not actually medical experts the authority to undermine the local requirement to identify an infectious agent and to identify for that particular thing mitigation measures that are not arbitrary and capricious. And part of the problem we we see, and I've said, sits there, have sit there. It sits in every aspect of your life because every aspect of your life is engaged with by this organization. And we see the first up, up and comings of that. It sits there to hurt you and intends to hurt you. The state bar passes mandatory COVID-19 vaccination recommendation. The state bar of New York passes a mandatory COVID vaccination recommendation. The New York State Bar Association on Saturday passed a resolution urging the state to consider making it mandatory for all New Yorkers to undergo COVID-19 vaccinations when a vaccine becomes available, even if people object to it for religious, philosophical, or personal reasons. If you thought the Bar Association had your best interest in mind and who you think you are and what you think you're about and what you believe and what you want to do in your life and who you want to associate with or any of the other things that the founding fathers in few words told you you had right, your liberty to be free from all this, the Bar Association in New York City again, the same place that the Alliance popped up to get rid of the drugs in Oregon, across the nation, if you don't think they have a, a big effect, in New York, those bar attorneys want you to have mass mandatory COVID-19. What's the connection? Well, go to that uh, petition in Tennessee I've been talking about. And where, what page? What is it? Fact, go down to fact, uh, what, 83 to about 87 or so? Yeah. 
83 or so to 87, I think that's the numbers. Go look at the connection to the Bar Association, to climate change, to COVID, through the UN, all in documents from way back to 1991 and before. Well, how would you get there? Go read it. That these people in the Bar Association are your enemy. They don't care that the vaccination for flu-like symptoms that now the CDC identifies as the common cold in that last document can't have a vaccine but wants to make them mandatory despite the recognizing in this that you ought to have religious, philosophical, per or personal reasons. And there's more. That's not the only ones, but that's the only ones they acknowledge. The rest they could care less about. The Bar Association that wants to do this cannot be, when you go to the court and using one of their agents, trusted. And this is the big killer word here. Your trust and confidence in that, in them, to protect you. Neither the judge, who's a bar member. And I say, return you back over to that petition in Tennessee and go look at what it says about the bar, the judiciary in that state and every state capitulating to the executive, breaching the separation of powers to not investigate whether or not the executive followed the law to adopt the orders of the executive branch in violation of the establishment. So those of you who say, oh, you're going to go, not going to go into a corrupt system because it's corrupt. No, the, the system is quite fine, thank you very much. The framework sits there to be used. When are you going to use it? And to say, oh, I'm not going to enter because it's a corrupt system, is the height of absurdity in my mind. As I keep now, it's actually starting to wear on me just a little bit more than it was before. Keep on moving. Coronavirus COVID-19 Information Center, uh, New York Bar. I got another, another uh, link that goes through that shows the New York Bar will exceed to the judiciary will exceed to the existence of the coronavirus bogus, the myth. Remember, coronavirus is not the novel anything. It's the common cold. COVID-19 is said to be caused by SARS-CoV-2. You've never heard that in this whole broadcast in all this information. They don't even recognize it anymore. It's not stopping that. So COVID-19 is not a cause it's a set of coughing, sneezing, sniffling, and stuffy head medicine type stuff. How is it that they are then embracing that, that it exists as all is the same fiction they destroy you in you every day that you trust is sitting right in your system. That part of the system is corrupt. You don't engage that corruption in the system. It's already in a, it's an established agency in your states. You don't engage that corruption? That's an absurdity. The system's not corrupt. These people are. They've Im Im seated themselves in the system, and the people were not vigilant to throw them out. And to, to just say you can oh, snap your finger now and we'll get them out is, is really ignorance at the height of stupidity. S-T-O-O-P-I-D. And that's what I'm looking at all this week, a society of stupid. I don't even know what more to put. It, I don't even know how to res reflect and respond to that. We're watching this thing come roll out every day, everything going out and telling us exactly who's doing it, and we won't respond to it, which sets you up for, oh, I can't go into the, can't rely on the system. That's right. You call them out. Go look at the petition in Tennessee. It calls out the judiciary. It calls out the, in the, I don't know how to say this. You don't call them criminals. You show that they're going to breach the law. And then you ask, you position the you position the, the context in that means if there's breach of law, then what are you expecting? What is there to expect? The statement then is that it can't be trusted. It, there's no confidence in that system. And then, as you'll see, it states that that's a constitutional crisis. Is that the system being corrupt? No. The Constitution says it's not supposed to be that way. It's the those moving the levers behind the curtain that you've never pulled back and truly understood that are getting away with it because you won't enter in properly. I guess that's a new advocation for today. At any rate, I don't know what to say. It's not something that's a hands-off right now. They really do have us in a way that this is things going on and getting worse, and they're taking every opportunity to plausibly give them authority, certainly in the ignorant, in, in stupid, in, in view of stupid, it looks, it looks right. 
But when you see somebody like Michigan's governor, what, what she's willing to do, despite what the code said, what, despite what the system said properly, not corrupt it. And you don't see that the danger of that when they get a hold of something like the CDC plan of assumption of power, where they have none at all, then you've missed the whole problem, and you are the problem. Really, you are the problem, because it took all of us to arrest the problem. And none of us, I say that generally, none of us are. Law enforcement secret facial recognition program could cover every straight. Of course, this is what's coming down. They took it out of the sky. They now stuck it inside everywhere you go. Cameras, everyone, every cop has a camera. That's fine in a way. But see, they tied it to other AI. They knew that was coming. License plate readers, cameras everywhere. Their facial recognition, why? Because of track and contact tracing and the requirement and the businesses get beat down and no one stops it. The businesses don't know how to stand up. The salons were the first one to step up. How many cases have you heard get come out with all that? What happened to all that? Why were the salons a vain, a vanity thing, the first ones to object? And no one came to support that either can't be that the system's corrupt. The people are corrupt. The people don't like to hear me say that. Oh, yeah, you're blaming us. Yeah, well, we had an obligation. Where else, who else is going to? If the good people don't, if the non-criminals don't arrest the criminal, what do you expect? Law enforcement secret facial recognition program could be in every state. American law enforcement has been secretly using facial recognition program that uh, can be used uh, to ID activists and protesters and people that don't believe in COVID and the deniers, the climate deniers, the, vo the vaccine deniers, the COVID deniers, all the deniers of the system that's been put around, your, around you. So I guess when I read that too, and I'll put in, and I don't have it uh, here real quick, but there's also... The databases that they're using, and I'll put this in the broadcaster because I can't get there the way this uh, is set up. These facial recognition databases are set up and tied to the military. I don't have that link. You'll get that in the broadcaster. You don't think what I've been telling you about this is a military operation is in force and effect and they're using the assets outside the system? That might actually be a defense. What do you mean there's no assets? You're using the United States military. Eventually, it's going to be the global military police. What do you mean there's no assets? But anyway, back to this. The database that's used by the cops or military, they're coming to keep a track of you. But that's not new news. But when you look at the track contact tracing and COVID fraud and what they're going to do with internment camps, and your, your evidence that they have in record says you're one of the people that are high risk, and they can lie now, and they're going to lie then to get you into be that status, and then they'll take away any objective basis for you to, to, to get out, unless you know how to do a habeas and maybe have some people that can help you. You're all going away. Anyone they focus on, you're going away. They'll use your age against you. They'll use the fact that you took a, your eye was a little Dragon, so maybe you got you look a little bit cross-eyed. The, 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 oh, you took a limp. Oh, you coughed. You sneeze. Oh, you wiped your nose. Oh, you have the symptoms. They're making it up, just like they made up COVID, and y'all fell for it. And our fold, even if you object, you're falling for it because it continues. And you see how you see evidence of how bad it's going to be in Governor Whitmer, whatever her name is, in Michigan. You see how bad they can get. And you see even worse, a federal agency having no power at all, saying they already have plans for you. This is fascinating to watch. I mean, I'm really stunned. And when they want to give you notice that after they've contact traced you, they're going to give you a subpoena, and they can serve it through where? Well, we have it even from Saudi Arabia. We want to see how global this is already going. Saudi crown princes serve U.S. court summons. New documents filed with U.S. federal court show the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was last month issued a summons via WhatsApp to face charges of torture and directing an assassination attempt against the former Saudi security advisor. So, even the billionaires can be hit with a summons through what? Your phone. 
through your technology, your digital technology, this non-decentralized, non-centralized thing that has the ability to legally touch out and long-arm you into notice, then what do they do that for? Because once you give a notice, then you become subject because you're high risk. You don't even have to be the infector. You're just high risk of getting it. Now, how'd they figure that one out? See, those of you that are listening to me, you need to pass the information. You have to address the susceptibility. I told you this was going to come up. Important. Susceptibility. How'd they determine that? Your habeas will have to start to refine itself as you move, if you've learned how to do any at all, which I'm finding. I don't know why people can't follow what I'm saying. Just go to the statutes. Find out what they say. Copy and paste that into a document and start literally using that as your form. Fill in the information they ask you by statute or rule. You better have one of those in your pocket, and you better have people that know how to fill them out for you or have your signature. You have to cross. Actually, what you should be doing is filling these things out and handing them to friends, and you hand a signed copy to each other. Why? It's not supposed to happen. This is another corruption. You're supposed to have someone be able to come in on your behalf to file which makes sense if you're locked up. But someone on your behalf can file what they've done, said, what they've said over a number of times I've had to experience. Well, this doesn't have their, the one who's locked up signature on it. And they won't accept your filing with your signature. So what we found out is you have to have copies of habeas laying around elsewhere that can be had with the signature of the one that might be in. I've never said that, but there's, a, there's the fact. This is how serious it's starting to get. You have to have... A, have more countermeasures against this corruption. My hope is that lots of people start doing it and they learn they better not. But okay, so you can be the richest, one of the richest guys in the world. You're going to get your computer, your little phone is going to be a summons. This is going to be a legal instrument, as I told you it was. It's not what you think that that phone is. So how do you get away from it? Well, you don't have one. How's that? You don't have one that has all the potential to be communicated to. You, you get discreet with what you do and who you do it with. That's what, another way about the RSS. I thought you, you know you only subscribe to that. And I saw I could I can't keep focus on the chat. I see little comments. I'm looking over my eyes, just glance. I see little things. I think Grimner responded to the RSS and uh, a little bit. Now I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not saying concurrence or not. I didn't really get the context, but there was a response to it. And I thought it was basically um, an, a little bit of an agreement that the use might be okay, and then it's subscription. So if you're just reaching out to someone who offers, that's not going to be as easily traced, and especially when you start getting into other things like you nest your, your transmissions in other communications, like maybe a Hunix system might do for you, and the Tor, even though that has some problems, again, you're just putting up as many obstructions as you can to communicate with only those that you that you want to to get information because they want to block it out. But here we have, you're out in the open on these social medias. They are a conduit of legal summons. If you didn't think you were vulnerable and they're going to use this capacity in the situation you heard about COVID, so-called. All right, so put the Put two and two together. That's why this even story, I think, even hits us. To let us know, yeah, even the big guy's going to get taken out. We can use this for this process. And it's valid. They've just made everything valid, it seems. The Kim.com case, in a way, although I do have a problem with that because there isn't just copyright. If that was just a copyright case and the, and the man never went into the United States, how they could even have a case against him is it shows the extent of the criminality. Now, that said, there may be some things that, there could be at a long arm, but I'm not sure how what that could be at this point. But this is the extent of criminality within the system that nobody checked. And then when they checked it, they checked it either the wrong way or they went to the perpetrator to get the answer. So your phone is, again, we get it back to the centralization of the control grid. The tracking, the tracing, the, 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 the summons by the officials, the notices by the officials what you're doing, where you're doing it, how you're doing it, who you're doing it with, all, all that stuff. Is when they handed that device to you and you bought it. You actually paid for the service. And what do they do? They have your whole monetary life, the economic life on there. Another Bitcoin firm turns its back on Venezuela. Uh, a couple of articles out of decrypt.co uh, here. Uh, in brief, on this story, Bitcoin wallet cold storage service provider Zapo is shutting down Venezuela. 
Zapo said that in an email that the customers that it's because of its shift in banking uh, digital banking services. It joins a growing list of crypto current companies that are no longer doing business in Venezuela. Uh, some of them due to U.S. sanctions. Enough said for that. For my purposes, to tell you, whatever uh, wallet, ever digital currency, they're all wanting to get into the digital banking services. They're into the system. I don't care what they tell everybody. And now you see that if you're in Venezuela, you may not have the access to this digital realm. And this is private companies doing this. The $955 million in Bitcoin hackers have just been moved. A Bitcoin wallet of 69,370 Bitcoins were just moved its holdings out. Here, let's just stop there. You can read the rest of this story. This is an interesting story to expose something. It exposes that you can track this stuff. Now, it may be coming more apparent to people that it's trackable. Some t people thought this was a secret. I said this. I don't even fully understand all the technology, and I told you it was trackable. It's the plan. They have to get you into the system. Now they saw it tracked. They found this money, and then this story pops out. Record $1 billion worth of Bitcoin linked to Ross Ulbrich, seized by U.S. government. If you think digital currency, Bitcoin, whatever, is not being tracked and watched, that the government can't ever grab it, you're deluded. I've told you I like the idea of digital currency. Just something you can transfer between people. You have trust that you can keep moving. It's just a medium of exchange. I like that. But this was never really set up for that. It's going to take a very organized group of people silently work together to pull this off for that purpose. But if you think Bitcoin's anything and you think it's it's untouchable, give it up. They can track this. And the United States government went right after it. It's the same number of coins, over a billion dollars value, they say, that the government will auction off. And then we get this story. The social network just took, this social network took another step toward becoming uncensorable. Now, I'm getting to see this word censorship and uncensorable and sensing, censorshipping things is kind of expanding now. Isn't your money censored when they come and grab it from you because they can track it? A little bit of money moved, they tracked it to someone, they stole it from, they're gone. Oh, just like that little, what is it, South Park or whatever, and it's gone. Just like that. So, so social network minds, and I have an account at Minds. I just post my broadcast up. Don't get much, again, don't get much inter interaction. Thank you at Minds for anybody who does. I do appreciate it. Hope you pass out the information. And thank you to those that do pass out the information. And I think Reminding does that as well. Socialnetworkminds.com has added an ability to save posts to our weaves permaweb. The addition is billed as being a measure of censorship resistant for social posts. The Ethereum-based a social network claims more than 3 million users. That's fascinating to me because I get like 100 maybe a week, on a week, maybe for weeks and months on end uh, for 3 million. Interesting. Nobody's interested behind the woodshed. I'll just tell you that. Anyway, so it goes through and tells us about this permanent blockchain that's uncensorable about all your posts. And I want you to just think about what they just did with the, all those Bitcoins that were sitting there uh, in the United States government went to grab up and stole underneath a claim. And it goes through and makes this connection to this story promoting our weave. And it goes down and talks about all these promotions about how it's going to free up that Internet site. And it goes down and it talks about a bunch of people engaging in the purchasing of the investment of this into mines. One comes up to be Coinbase Ventures. Another one is Andreessen Horowitz of Union Square Ventures. And I'm going, Coinbase Ventures? I don't know these people, but folks, Coinbase Ventures and Coinbase Exchange seem to come to mind. And so I went over to Coinbase. And sure enough, you look at the wiki, for those of us ignorant enough just to go over and look and see what the heck the world's, how the world is wired anymore. And you look, Coinbase Ventures, as it, I read here in the wiki, was a Coinbase exchange venture capital group that they started, which is now investing in mines. And you see Horowitz in here, too, is here as well. And you also hear that the Internal Revenue Service came in and demanded from Coinbase names of identities of users over $20,000. 
that Mines is promoting as the blockchain protection, which has been now invested by Coinbase Ventures. And then we go over to Coin, a story coming out of Coinbase to find that Coinbase gets a lot of data requests from the Fed. Doesn't seem to be the ideal non-censorship site when it's actually a place where permanent records are made forever. You pay for it. That the government hands its fingers in. That they can use that information for anything they deem they need it for. And I told you before, they would take this information and they make stuff up. They certainly get a psychological profile which makes stuff up. Do you become high risk to that made stuff up minority reporting? I think you really need to reconsider what's going on in these cryptocurrency type issues, these blockchain, more importantly, technologies. They're not private. They're not helping secure anything. Well, they're securing you, but it's in a chain down mode. Blockchain is a servitude. I can't stress this enough, and I haven't apparently stressed it enough to scare enough people to start really looking at how to really rethink what they're doing. COVID is bringing the need of all this together. Not that it's going to be Bitcoin, not that it's going to be mines, that it's all these private public partnerships bringing their databases susceptible to governments that are then then manipulated as they want, as they need. And as we were ignoring, I told you, you think that Bitcoin was going to be a standout. No, it's not a standout. It's not separate. It's not decentralized. They went right after the one billion. That's a cost. That's somebody's supposed money. That's also somebody's freedom. We don't know. They don't have any much more information because it's in the background about how that happened. But it went through all these same companies, all these same players in the background are who you are re giving confidence to. Warning, the European Central Bank is preparing to launch a digital euro. It is every day, I mean, every week now. Christine Lagarde, we talked about her. We, I told you this was coming. She's telling us it's coming. This is not, this is not a prediction. This is a, them giving us notice before. Christine Lagarde, president of European Central Bank, just posted in her Twitter, we've started exploring the possibility of launching a digital euro. As Europeans, no, not around the tree, as Europeans are increasingly turning to digital in the ways they spend, save, and invest, we should be prepared to issue digital euro if needed. I'm also keen to hear your views on it. Well, maybe you should tell her. But this is the point. It's moving into this because they say it's you're asking for it. And boy, are you asking for it, folks. I don't know what else to say, but you're asking for it. Where they're setting up through COVID the need of all the technology they presumed you to be subject to or can cause you to be subject to that you are not responding to, that the, the black and white system that everyone claims is so corrupt the framework says it's not supposed to be happening, and you're not saying anything about it. And that is allowing the criminal to continue. Thank you, Grin, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Appreciate all the effort you do there and give us a place for the broadcaster and the archives so other people can get it. Uh, Grammy Mary over at Spreaker for keeping that going. Thank you there. Jules at YouTube. UCY.TV, I hope you're okay. Notice that wasn't many postings this week. I hope everything's fine. Sound Minds, thank you there. Normalization of ignorance, thank you to the commenter there. Minds, BitChute Walrus, I don't know what happened to your account. I hope you're okay. So thank you very much, folks. I'll be with you next week. Tech Diffs or Nature Will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>